So I want to start with just a little bit of history. Where have companies come from? How do they think about green and sustainability? There's this idea that green is an invader, that it doesn't belong in the boardroom, that it's just about compliance with the law, cost, it's just expensive, that it's not about brand value or revenue or these kind of upside things. And the case that I'm going to make to you is that seeing business through a sustainability lens actually lowers costs. It doesn't raise them. lowers them permanently. And more than that, it drives innovation, which is the core topic for today. It's a new way of seeing your business. Now, this is a very simple model of value creation in a company. There's only so many ways to create value. You're either reducing the downsides, reducing costs, reducing risk, or you're pumping up the upside, driving revenue, building brand value. This is what we do every day in our jobs. If not, we're probably destroying value, which happens. There's been a lot of discussion for years about kind of green driving innovation on the cost side. And just to give you a sense of scale, DuPont is now profitable basically because of their eco-efficiency efforts. They save two to three billion a year on waste and energy reductions. That's about their net income. Dow has cut nine billion out of their energy spend over the last decade. 3M has found billions of savings for three decades now by consistently finding new ways to do things that saves money, saves energy, saves waste, saves water. And GM I love because this is really interesting. They moved almost all of their facilities, their plants, to zero waste to landfill. And in doing that, they took something that was an expense, hauling off waste, and turned it into a profit center. They've made two and a half billion dollars over the last few years on waste. If I was their supplier, I'd be thinking, we, we must be supplying them with too much stuff. If they're able to sell it for that much, right? There's something wrong there. But this is huge savings. So finally, I want to talk about a bunch of examples around this kind of creativity and heresy, which is really the core message. You can change processes. How many people know this story? UPS no longer takes left turns in cities. I'm curious how many people know this. A handful. For those of you who haven't heard this story, why would you stop taking left turns? Well, if you're waiting at a traffic light to cross traffic, you're idling. You're wasting time, energy, and money. So using GPS software, they rerouted their trucks to basically go in concentric circles to the right. Just keep taking right turns. They're saving 28 million miles, 3 million gallons. It's great savings, right? Good savings, good story. But this to me is culture. This is a critical story. I want you to take yourself back to the first meeting where someone said, why don't we stop taking left turns? <laughs> Who's with me? Come on. I, I don't know if they're still working there or whatever, but you know, it was kind of wacky. It turned out there was a lot of reasons to do this, and FedEx, has, people have asked me to stop only talking about UPS. They do it too, waste management does. A lot of people with fleets do this now. There's a lot of reasons. There were safety reasons. It turns out that all the fatalities in the, in the company, most of them were on left turns. I mean, there's a lot of benefits of this, and so companies are discovering it. But again, it's kind of a crazy thing because just going to the right actually would probably lengthen your route. So you have to combine that with, with rerouting software, right? It's part of a package of better, smarter thinking. Packaging has changed a lot. This is Puma. Puma has become kind of a recent leader in sustainability. And they designed something really neat, which is the bags in the store, instead of the big cardboard box that has four sides and the top, it has no top. And the bag you carry it out in is now part of the packaging. They reduced the, the footprint and, and packaging like 60% to do this. HP had a test product for a while with a laptop where this is all the material at top, all the laptop components. It goes into a nice canvas bag. I think it was recycled material. That's, a, that's part of the product. It's, you can carry the, the uh, computer. It goes in this box. The only packaging is the box. So imagine you normally get a laptop, and there's like styrofoam molded components for every piece. The only packaging here is the box. It's like 96% less packaging. Why do we need packaging? We do in many cases. There's lots of products that need to be protected. But these are the kinds of questions we're starting to ask. We're looking at new markets. India is a really interesting example. There's something called the bottom of the pyramid, if people have heard of this. And what that means is if you draw a pyramid of income and wealth in the world, you know, there's the 1% at the top. There's people making decent money, 10, 20, 30,000 a year per capita. And then there's a lot of people down at the $1 a day kind of thing. Those are the dire poverty. Right above that, kind of near the bottom of the pyramid, are people who are growing in income, who are becoming middle class. And they're a target market. Procter & Gamble and others have been making little packages, little versions of their products for years so people can afford it. Now, what's happening is interesting. We're starting to realize that that market is a source of innovation, not just a market. There's something called reverse innovation. So Tata Nano came out a couple years ago, a $2,000 car. 
Now, why on the website it's pictured in front of wind turbines, I have no idea, because it's not an electric car. There's nothing green about this car whatsoever, but OK, fine. It's in front of wind turbines. I don't really know why. But the point is they can make a car for $2,000. It hasn't been very successful for lots of reasons. But they found a way to make a car for a fraction of the cost. And Unilever is probably the leader right now. They're doing some, some things I, I've never really seen large public companies do. They've got this kind of simple looking sustainable living plan. And it looks like a lot of other companies on some level. They've got goals around big things like improving well-being, reducing impact, enhancing livelihoods, and some sub-goals around kind of big areas of their business. A lot of people aren't that familiar with Unilever, but they make a lot of really big popular food and uh, personal care brands like Dove. Now what's interesting about this and what makes them different is that the sustainable living plan is not their sustainability plan and they have their vision 2020 and some other strategy plan like almost every company. This is their plan. This is their growth plan. What they've said, the core mission is that they want to double sales, double revenue by 2020, and have their footprint. And what they're saying is we're not going to double sales despite reducing our footprint. We're going to double sales because we did it, because we made the products that consumers wanted because we showed how to reduce impacts. We're going to innovate our way there. This is what they're saying. So how do we do this? I think we need to systematize innovation. I'm borrowing this, this phrase, systematize, from the Clayton Christensen crowd. Scott Anthony, who works up there. and They have this, this kind of idea about making this part of the, the system of a company. And I thought about this from the perspective of sustainability. What do we need to do? Well, we need to gather the data, as I talked about, and understand where our hotspots are. We need to build scenarios, talk about the possible futures and where we fit into those futures. We need to push successes to kind of logical conclusions or even further. It's good to say, hey, can we wash in cold water? But imagine then asking, well, do we need to wash at all? Can we treat clothes in a way they don't need to be washed as much? That's the kind of question that's really disruptive that people are starting to ask. Can we make this a systematic part of design and R&D? Make it someone's job, not the sustainability executive, but someone in R&D. That's starting to happen. You've got to make time for this. 3M and Google are sort of famous for taking 15 or 20 percent of everyone's time and saying, do what you want with it. It's been pretty effective for them. I think we need to do that for sustainability. Say some percentage of all designers' time is to think about these big issues, climate and water and waste, and what does that mean for our business. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? I've seen this phrase used in social movements for years. And I always wondered where it came from. So I did some really deep research. I Googled it one day and uh, discovered in like seven seconds that it's actually 2,000 years old. A part of this phrase was written by a rabbinical scholar at the time of Jesus. It's been around almost as long as our society. And it has this kind of core idea that we are not solely responsible for everything, but we better get going. We have a deep responsibility. So I invite people to join this sustainability movement to go back to your organizations and your families and talk about this. Because together, starting now, we can build a more profitable, healthy, and sustainable companies, country, and planet.